Thank you very much, Mark. I'm here to talk about Scottish Mortgage, which is an investment trust that Bailey Gifford has run since its inception in 1909. And really what we're looking to do is to do something different. And that's because we believe, like the earlier speaker this morning, that doing something different is good. And there are many ways to do that, and I'm here to talk about how we do it. And the first point I would emphasise is the long-term nature of our approach to investing. It's clear that over time, average holding periods within stock markets have been compressed. People are repeatedly asked by their own clients, what's my portfolio done in one year, every quarter? And really that takes away the focus of the long-term nature of the businesses they're investing in when you're investing in stocks. So taking the long-term approach that we do for Scottish Mortgage actually takes time and particularly volatility and uses it to our shareholders, your clients' advantages. And we see that as a key competitive advantage of what we're doing, and that's really important to understand why you could be successful at what you're doing. We don't believe that we are any better than anybody else at timing short-term market swings, so we simply don't do it. What we will look at is if volatility disconnects a company's fundamentals from its share price, and then either we will look to take advantage of that by buying in if the shares have fallen or not, or by trimming the position if they seem to have run up on market exuberance ahead of where the company's fundamentals are. The next point I would make is that it's important to be global in the way that you invest. Increasingly, that's the way company business is going, particularly those that we're looking to invest for Scottish Mortgage. This is about following economic reality and not just index conventions. Increasingly, where a company lists its shares has little or nothing to do with the fundamental drivers behind its revenues, either because they're spread across the globe or because actually they're generated in different markets to where the company is listed. The other thing is that we are ashamedly growth investors. This is because we believe that over short-term periods, macro concerns, market panics might impact a share price that has, in a way, as I mentioned, that has nothing to do with the company fundamentals. But over the long-term investment horizons that we have of five and 10 years, a share price should react to a company that can grow its earnings much faster than the market, and you should see that come through and be rewarded. And that's what we're looking to do. We're also clear that we are active managers in doing this. It's not possible to do this on an index plus basis. We take no regard of the index when we con construct our portfolio. This is just about picking the best ideas around the world for those companies that we think over the next five to 10 years will be the truly exciting growth companies. Now, why do we think that's a good approach to take? It is quite different from other people in the market. And that's because we've done analysis on stock market returns and the average is the median place, but it's clear that the majority of returns actually come from one or two extraordinary winners who can grow so much faster than the market, almost irrespective of what macroeconomics is doing. And I'll give you an example of that. So Amazon is a large holding the portfolio. This is not about finding small and whizzy companies to invest in. This can go right across the market cap spectrum. We believe that at less than 1% of US retail sales, Amazon in its own domestic market has plenty of growth left. Last year it grew at over 20% per annum in North America alone. Even in 2009, in the, the very difficult period that the US market had, it was still growing its top line in double digits. Not every investment that you take over this time horizon is going to succeed. By its nature, if you could predict with absolute certainty how fast a company would grow and what it would make from that, it would already be in the price and there would be no opportunity from us. You have to accept the inherent uncertainty in investing this way. But what's clear from the asymmetry is that when you get the winners, they more than pay for your mistakes. So finding those winners is what we concentrate on doing. Now, Bailey Gifford itself is a private partnership owned by 40 people, all of whom work full-time in the business. Why does this matter to the way we invest? Well, it's because we do not have external shareholders to whom we have to report our own quarterly earnings. When we think about our business, where our time horizons are aligned with those of the companies we invest in, and hopefully the shareholders that hold Scottish Mortgage and the other clients of Bailey Gifford, because we think of our business on a five, 10, and 15 year horizon. 
So this long-term mindset is really fundamental to what we do. It sounds deceptively simple, but it's not easy. We're looking for those growth companies and we're looking for them over a five and 10 year horizon. So over a short period, a company may just be fortuitous as to where it is in the market. And you might see its earnings uh, come through, you might see a share price jump. But over five and 10 years, what's really key here is what do management want to do with the company? There can be a great opportunity, but if management don't agree with us, we will not see this ultimately come through in the earnings of the company over a five year period. So getting to know management is extremely important. An example of this would be that we invested in eBay and we thought that PayPal had the opportunity not to be an add-on to MasterCard and Visa, but really challenge the way payments are made in the e-commerce world. Sadly, the company didn't agree with us and we sold out. It's not our style to be as vocal as Mr. I can about that, but you can be certain that we were engaging with the company to understand where they thought we were taking it. So we simply sold out the shares and invested our money where we thought we could make more for our shareholders. This access to management has been a real shift and the portfolio also includes unlisted investments. It's a small but growing part of the business. It's around 10% now of the portfolio. Why is this? Well, increasingly what we've seen is that a number of the growth companies are actually managing to, to grow with much less capital. They don't need to build things to sell. They've got a much less uh, capital intensive requirement. So an example here would be that Facebook listed in 2012. And Mark Zuckerberg has explicitly stated that he did that to buy the server capacity necessary to run Facebook. Today, he would not need to do that. He wouldn't need that same extraordinary capital injection that a public market can provide because he could simply rent that from Amazon Web Services with a huge backup system in place and the advantages of all the scale that Amazon brings. Why is this important? Because we're seeing these companies choose to go to private rounds of investing, depriving the public markets of those extraordinary growth periods. For example, Microsoft listed in 1986, 100% of its value is based, has been able to be accessed by public market investors. Share prices are moving around a little bit at the moment, but roughly speaking, Facebook listed in 2012, around 60% of its value has been created as a public business. We invested back in 2012 in the Chinese company Alibaba, which does a very similar thing to Amazon. It's an e-commerce player. It's by far and away the largest in the Chinese market with over 70% share of e-commerce. Now, we took that as a stake from Yahoo in 2012 and a much lower valuation. We kept our shares through the recent IPO and it's fair to say those shares have been very volatile over the previous months on broader concerns about China and then a, a wider market move. We still believe that given as less than half of the potential people in China are online, given the lack of existing infrastructure and given that e-commerce and generally consumption is where the Chinese government want to take their own economy, Alibaba is offering a particularly attractive investment proposition despite its size. This is not a small whizzy company, it listed with a valuation of $168 billion. At the moment, almost all of its value creation has been created whilst a private company. Now clearly we believe that it has a long way to go, we have a sizable holding in the portfolio. That said, even if it gets to the market cap of Apple, over 25% of its value will still have been created whilst a private company. A private company with an established business and cash flow generative. We see this slowly uh, shifting balance of power in the capital markets towards the consumers of capital and away from the providers actually as positive because the key thing here is that it allows people to run their businesses without the short-term pressures of meeting quarterly earnings targets. Actually, that should be good for the long-term business. It should be good for ours as long-term shareholders. So it's something that we're keen to see. We don't see this as a change in what we're doing. Many of these companies we would have expected to list in previous years. So this is just us reacting to the way that these companies are. Also key is the fact that it's giving these companies more say over who gets allocations in IPOs. And we've seen the benefit of that when we participated 
in the Rocket Internet and Zalando IPOs because we have a reputation for being long-term owners of businesses. When we go and speak to company management, we don't ask them, we don't mention quarterly earnings targets because those are all published. We don't look at them unless we can see something that has fundamentally changed in our investment case or the way the business is done. We're far more interested in knowing what they're going to do for the next five years. How is their business going to grow? What's their capital allocation? Are they generating cash to fund that or are they having to do that via debt? So if that engagement management uh, is critical, we see that being that, having that reputation actually benefits us and therefore our shareholders. Jeff Bezos at Amazon gives six hours a year in terms of investor time. He will not talk to those from Wall Street who want to talk about quarterly earnings. And we're fortunate enough to get an hour of his time. Obviously, that's critical to understanding Amazon's business. Because we supported Alibaba through 2012, we have a good relationship with management and with Jack Ma. Why is that particularly important for the wider portfolio? Because if anybody can tell us what's happening in e-commerce in China, one of the, by some measures, the largest market, but definitely the second largest market in the world, and with a much higher e-commerce penetration at 11% than any other market, it's going to be Jack Ma at Alibaba because it's his company that's driving it. One of the key benefits of Scottish Mortgage is in fact that our closed-ended investment trust structure allows us to do this, allows us to be patient. We don't have the same problems of an open-ended fund that require the same liquidity to allow for capital flows. And we're fortunate enough to be the largest uh, investment trust by size. That means that we have liquidity in our shares of around £5 million a day, but it also means that we can take sizable positions in these businesses to give us meaningful engagement. I realise that I haven't gone as far through. So really, what patience is the key to doing this. So more interesting than that is actually the fact that we are extremely excited for the new companies coming into the portfolio from here. We've talked about the internet in terms of e-commerce. We also own Google. We own Baidu, which is the Chinese equivalent search engine. And we think the technology that drif drove the uh, internet, both in terms of silicon chips advancement and battery power moving devices onto mobile, um, has been very successful, has a long way to run. It's clear that some of these internet businesses that are more in the social media space have run way ahead of the advertising revenues um, that have stayed in the traditional media. But actually what's key today is those technologies being applied to other areas. And we think that that's a real challenge to some of the sleepy incumbents who are not actually investing for the future. They're returning cash to shareholders today, but they're not actually investing for the future, and we see that as being critical. And that's true in a number of areas. So we own uh, in Illumina, which is the gene sequencing company. Their addressable market over the last two years has fundamentally shifted from the academic realm into clinical application as the costs of gene sequencing have fallen dramatically to so under $1,000 a gene sequence back in January 2014, and they've continued falling. We're also looking at those companies that are building on that technology, looking at providing healthcare that is targeted to those who need it so that you know what it is and you know that it'll work and it'll be cheaper than existing drugs that are given to everybody. That's helpful for the broader healthcare environment, but we've got a large holding in Illumina because what's clear is that you will need your gene sequenced to access all of these. So if you like, we're building, buying the equivalent of the nuts and bolts and spanners. Transportation is another area that we see as undergoing a fundamental shift. We bought into Tesla. We think this is a very exciting company. Even if you just look at the car, and this is a car that can do 0 to 60 in three seconds, it has a 300 mile range. That's much better than anything of the established auto companies have managed to produce, despite spending billions of euros on doing so. They're releasing their concept car now, but Tesla is much further ahead. We think they can grow their car company, doubling their revenues and bringing it through. But what they're doing with those revenues is then reinvesting them. So we're not seeing them drop down to earnings at the bottom line. That's something we're completely comfortable with because we believe what they're spending their capex on should give them a competitive advantage that's sustainable for the long run. This is about looking at that, understanding why these companies will be long-term winners and what threats they pose to other people. They also have a considerable investment in the Gigafactory, which is not just about making the car batteries, but also about stationary batteries, which starts to impact on how you store renewable energy. 
this is something that answers a question that the, the world needs to find an answer to, which is carbon um, emissions. It's not going to be about people choosing green. It's going to be about Tesla making the scales that makes it an economic choice that makes sense. We think we're heading that direction very quickly, quicker than other people realise, and that's what makes it so exciting. I'm reminded by James Anderson, who is the joint manager of the Trust, that in the 1970s, the Saudi oil minister, Sheikh uh, Zaki Yamani, made the following comment in the context of where would oil prices go? And he said the Stone Age didn't end for a lack of stone. I think there's been a lot of complacency in some of these entrenched industries. They're not investing for the future. They're not looking at what the new technologies can bring them. But let's go through. When we're investing, it's back to nuts and bolts. This is all about picking the individual companies. And this is probably on more familiar ground. This is a simple, what do they do? Why will they be good at it? And why are they going to outlast anybody else? And the example I would pick here is Inditex, which owns the brand Zara. We were started up in a small village in Galicia in Spain by simply with the extraordinary change around of don't make something and then convince your customers as to why they want it. Just make what your customers want. Their supply chain doesn't run from China shipping into Europe. Their supply chain is built in Europe so that it can quickly respond to what consumers want. They do very small runs so that they don't have that overhang of stock. They've been extremely successful in doing so and their supply chain is better than anybody else's we've looked at in this fast fashion world. Not only that, but we think that Amancio Ortega, who's here at the bottom right-hand corner, is an extraordinary leader of the business and has set it up to look at the long-term returns on offer. It's clear that they're prepared to destroy their own existing business to move with the time. So one of the things the company says to us is the most exciting change is online retail. They're not afraid of their established store base getting cannibalized, Actually, for them, that's a competitive strength because people can either go and have a look in the store and then buy their size online, or, crucially, it solves the returns issue. No problem, you can go down to your local high street and return it. They very much see that the two should work together. They're not afraid about changing their existing business model. And that's extraordinary for a company that's already as large and successful as Inditex. It's about what we heard the previous speaker saying about management who are in place not being willing to change what they do. Well, this is a company that has shown that they are willing to evolve as the market evolves. Now, I'm conscious that we're coming through to the final thoughts. This is very much a growth investment trust. There are individual stories behind each of the companies we invest because this is about active investing and, cho and choosing the companies that we want for the long run. But in terms of our shareholders, in terms of your clients, here are some of the things that I think uh, you'll agree truly matter. And the first is always cost. So at Bailey Gifford, we have been backing Scottish Mortgage. We've been very successful and fortunate enough to grow the trust to a very large size. So we have dropped our annual management charge from 32 basis points to 30 in recognition of that, because we want this to be an ongoing relationship. They're our oldest client, and long may it continue. That means that the ongoing charges for the investment trust are 48 basis points. We hope in the future that we can continue to grow so we can continue to bring that ratio down. This is a company um, that could increase double its size and we would still have plenty of investment opportunities out there because some of the new companies coming through into the world are really challenging the existing incumbents and their potential markets are absolutely huge. Obviously, we believe that being long-term is key to what we do. And I would emphasize that this is not a trust that's suitable for everybody. We completely accept that. It is for long-term investors and those who are fortunate enough to have a long-term investment horizon that can take advantage of market volatility. We do want to strive for great returns. It's not going to come in a nice, smooth manner that mirrors the index. It's just not what we're aiming to do. We don't see that as our competitive advantage. We think over time that our results show that you will see those benefits come through, um, but it's not going to be a trust that smooths out the returns. Thank you very much for your time.